Um, okay, so uh, this is um, the first of hopefully many weekly catch-ups uh, that myself, Andres and myself, Andres and I, um, are going to be doing. So, Andres, w- welcome. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Kyle. No problem. Uh, for those of you unaware, Andres is our head of content at Wordify, and he's highly involved in you know, um, compiling the news for DXP report and newsletter we send out every single week. And so we regularly have discussions about, you know, what's happening in the space and we, we share that news with each other. And I thought, why not do that and have that conversation on air so that this can go out on a weekly basis and we can basically sort of recap what's been happening and, and discuss that. I think the, the, the biggest piece of news last week or so has been um, Instant Commerce's um, raise, uh, which I think was a, was it a seed round, Andres? Yeah, it's a seed round for 5.4 million euros. Yeah, that's right. So tell me a little bit more about that. Let's just recap that if you can. Yeah, so I think what's really interesting about this, so Instant Commerce, they're a headless storefront builder. So they're basically for Shopify merchants, but it's API-first platform, so it can work with any system. And they basically make it easier for these e-commerce brands to go headless if they're lacking like engineering resources. So they recently raised, I think earlier this year, um, they raised a pre-seed round and they only launched like eight months ago. So yeah. I think it's really another positive thing for like the whole headless architecture, headless commerce space where their brands building so much funding in 2022, even from last year in 2021. So it's good stuff on the horizon for the industry. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they're, they're one of many headless commerce um, players that have raised funds recently. I want to just quickly bring up their uh, their press release, which I'm just loading now. I'm just interested. I forgot what they specifically said. I always look when these press releases come out, what they yeah. specifically said about where they're going to spend that money. So I'm just having a look at that. There we go. Fine. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, You know, we, we know the team at Instant Commerce and they're great bunch of people. So yeah, it's, it's big news for them. And again, like I mentioned, it's um, just the, more of the same really for the headless space and headless commerce space specifically. Yeah. Um, moving on to like other stuff that we, we discussed in, in um, last week's DXP report, um, mm-hmm. composability versus like Martech bloat. This is something mm-hmm. I want to talk about. Yeah. So, and I've been talking about this on LinkedIn as well. I've got a LinkedIn post uh, that got some attention from uh, Venger, uh, Michael Bromley, the co-founder of, of Venger, uh, and also um, Nick Dunce, who is the um, he is the uh, chief revenue officer of Shuttle. Uh, and Shuttle is an interesting company, by the way, which we might come back come back to. Um, yeah. we, we may come back to that in a minute, but I want to I want to get back on on track with the the Martech blow um, versus composability, right? Because composability, you know, best of breed Mac, how you want to sort of label it. Mm. An architecture where you build again, you take, you choose best of breed products. We're going to choose this headless CMS. We're going to choose this CRM. We're going to choose that product information management system. Uh, Mailchimp here, Salesforce over there, and you've got you know eight eight ten different sort of um, best of breed products. And then on top of that, you've got plugins for each one, right? Yeah. As I see more and more headless players introducing marketplaces and plugins, I've been asking the question to a few different vendors, and, I, and again, I asked it on LinkedIn. Where where does where does a line get drawn right between building a best of breed stack with each component having its own plugins, mm-hmm. right, and you know that being a best of breed stack versus now okay we've we've ventured way too far into plugin reliance and just like you know falling into some of the issues that we used to face with WordPress right where you've got a WordPress um, blog or website. You've got 17 plugins and, and two themes somehow running to, to, to keep it running. And then, you know, suddenly something stops working. One plugin, an update happens to WordPress and, you know, eight of those plugins didn't get updated. Now that's broken. At what point do we start running into issues with, you know, a best of breed or a, or a composable stack that's got, you know, X amount of products and each product has plugins. Some of those plugins are built by the vendor. Some of them are not. Some of them are sort of community built at what point do you, do we draw the line and at what point do vendors again like maybe head the cms vendors are you know the are the ones to draw that line i don't know but do you yeah. see what i mean and is i mean what do you what do you think about this yeah so i definitely see what you mean because i actually saw um 
a recent statistic somewhere um, where it says that most enterprise companies have about, they have over a hundred different SaaS products that they use. Yeah. So I think what's, so I, I think we can definitely run into that issue where like you have so many plugins and like each, each platform you choose has its own group of plugins and whatnot. But I think we also have to remember that the whole concept of best of breed, composability, mock, however you want to uh, think about it is you get to choose what you in. Yeah. That's so, true. so that if, true. You, yeah, if you think that you do need all these other tools, like you can go ahead and do it if you want, but it doesn't necessarily force you in, into doing it per se. It just gives the option, I guess. That's, all yeah, I that's a good point. That's a good point. That's a good point. That, that is one, you know, dividing line between that and a WordPress where it's like, you know, you can choose to go with a head of CMS or with the e-commerce platform or the CRM that, you know, you vetted their plugins or you see that, you know, maybe they're not community, maybe they're not community built, maybe they're built by the vendor and therefore there's a, you know, much sort of higher uh, level of stability and security there. So wh yeah. when, when I put, when I publish this on LinkedIn, just a post, I'll read the post out. Um, plug uh, what I said is plugins and marketplaces are becoming more commonplace in head of CMS and head of commerce space. At what point do we start to enter a plugin driven model with all the issues that can bring? So again, um, Michael from Venger and Nick from Shuttle both responded to me uh, with relatively detailed responses. Um, first I'll go to what Michael said, because Michael sort of challenged me. He said, you know, can you elaborate on that? What kind of issues are you alluding to? It's a good question. And I'll elaborate here as well. Now, my main concerns with this are again, like security and maintenance, right? Like at what point do things start to break because of this, this sort of, you know, uh, composable system. How do we sort of combat that? Um, and that's basically what I said to, to, to Michael as well. And his answer to summarize, um, he's, he's got a very long post actually. So let me just quickly scan this to summarize it. Um, right. So he's, he said, he, what he's saying is I really want to avoid fostering a culture of, Oh, just search for a plugin to fulfill every bit of trivial custom functionality. That's a very good point. So yeah. again, WordPress did fall into that where it's like, Hey, Oh, you want, you want to change the font of the, of the sort of, you know, CTA button on that seventh page, then you've got a plugin specifically for that. That I agree. That was, um, that went way too far the other way. Yeah. Then he's, he continues. On the other hand, we do have plans to open up a plugin marketplace, but it will be geared towards larger non-trivial blocks of functionality. Fine. And I really hope to solve the quality and maintenance issue with strict vetting of third party vendors and automated and mandatory E to E end to end testing as part of standard standardized pipelines to deploy plugins to the marketplace. So yeah. this is basically, this is basically what the solution is. It's vendors taking a lot of responsibility over these plugins, either by building them themselves only, right. And, and, and maintaining them. And again, Michael from venture here is basically saying the way they'll do that and make it realistic is they'll only have plugins with like large blocks of functionality, right. They won't have like, a million plugins to do a million different little, little things, yeah. which I think is, is, is smart. Um, and Nick from shuttle kind of echoed this. So he replied, he replied to me and he said, the concept of modular and using an app store, uh, is fine. The, the, that model is fine. It's just yeah. a question of who's building those integrations. You may yeah. as well be an open source project. If it's, a, if it's the community, to me, it should be trusted partners or yourself, i.e. the vendors uh, that build those integrations. That's why we built shuttle anyway. Um, so yeah, that's basically, they, they kind of both made it the similar points where yeah. it can't be a WordPress or community driven, not WordPress, let's go away from WordPress. Can't be a community driven thing where, Hey, anyone can build plugins and you know, you can just list it on a, on our, on our marketplace and then people can download it and use it. Like Nick says, you, you may as well be an open source project at that point with, with all the issues that can bring. So yeah, I guess, I guess that is the solution, right? Just like plugins, not so many plugins and plugins with large blocks of functionality that the vendor either they specifically built it or it's a partner of theirs. And they've got like strong level of communication with that person. Because the last thing, the, the last thing you'd want to see is like a strappy plugin or a contentful plugin built by such and such developer. And like people begin to use that and rely on that quite a lot. And large companies begin to use that particular plugin, wherever yeah. it may be, maybe it's around personalization, maybe it's around banner ads, wherever it may be. And then it breaks. Right. And then, you know, just because they didn't update it because they didn't maintain it for a few weeks, something went wrong you know, that could really tarnish a brand, right? That could really tarnish a vendor. So yeah, yeah uh, I, I guess I just sort of went on a bit of a monologue there. Got, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, no, and then building on that, I think one thing about a lot of companies in like um, 
a lot of vendors in the hello space is that they do tend to listen to their customers. So for instance, if you think about um, over the last couple of years, how many headless, like who might've been considered pure headless vendors went on and upgraded the content offering platform. They're like, like I'm sure yeah. like the customers are gonna like, yeah, this works for us, but our marketers, our content offers aren't really getting what they need out of it. So yeah. they've been a lot more um, of those me saying, okay, we're gonna now revamp our entire content offering platform. I think maybe content style or content might have um, mentioned when they released like a new a new offering platform, they kind of mentioned some of those things. So I think a lot of these headless vendors, they probably won't necessarily just be making building that ecosystem marketplace integrations with just anyone. Sure, you have, you can do it with anyone because like most of these things are API first, but they're not necessarily just going out there saying, hey, you can build an integration if you want, and we're, we're going to list you in our marketplace just because you did it. It's, yeah. are, you fed, are you another catering to the same type of audience are, that we're doing? And um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That is a good point. I want to quickly now, because I want, I want to keep this concise, <laughs> although yeah. I went on a massive monologue. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at our notes document here. So you've mentioned front end, front end as a service. And although that's not something um, that's like, it is recent, it wasn't from this week's um, DXP report, but I'm glad you put it down because I think it's something that we need to discuss. So yeah, yeah you, you put it down. So why don't you jump into to front end as a service? Yeah, so front end as a service is going to seem to what, um instant commerce, but like they do offer front end service, uh, even though they're considering themselves a headless storefront, but they do offer that front end service. And yeah. The whole concept of it is basically you don't have, um, anytime you need to build those interfaces for your e-commerce brand. So whole purpose of headless commerce is lets you shop on any device and, and want any channel that you want, but developers still have to go and build those things. So I think a lot of these um, solution front as a service solutions and stuff, they're making it easier, not only for the non-technical crowd, like what um, Instacom is doing, but like others are even making it easier for developers. So developers don't have to just build everything from scratch every time. They can like use front end service solutions to help them get all the common functionality, like things like search, um, you might have a cart, all those sort of things and then just like put them on as a building the interface it makes it a lot easier yeah so it's basically like having having starters right it's kind of like what we're seeing with some headless uh, headless players having starters where it's like you know uh basically a template right basically a template um yeah. but yeah it, it goes back it goes back to what you were saying just now which is you know responding to responding to the response of like pure headless players right when pure headless come out there was a gap that was created there's not you know, there's not enough sort of publishing tools for non-technical marketers they've got no way to sort of preview content or just like have any sort of direct control over what the actual experience will look like right and we've yep. seen a lot of vendors sort of take steps some different paces take steps towards solving that and the front end as a service uh i guess you could just say like the, the, that niche saw that gap jumped into it and there's a few players that have, that have popped up there instant commerce being one of them on the, on the headless commerce side sort of fulfilling yep. that role they don't present themselves as the front end service but they could fulfill that role but yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, I, I'm, I do wonder like how, because we are seeing that trend of headless vendors adopting that kind of functionality, right? So for one that comes to mind is like, I mean, lots of come, lots come to mind, but Zesty.io, for example, they've got, they also have re released plugins recently specifically for this, which is like, you know, giving marketers the ability to, to sort of live edit uh, content or ed uh, edit uh, page layouts, like drag and drop type of way. So we're yeah. seeing that sort of be absorbed into uh, headless platforms. So I, I wonder how I wonder how big front end as a service will get. Like there's currently three large players in that space. From what I can remember, the I don't remember the, I don't remember the names. I think it's like two or three large players. Yeah, I do wonder if we'll reach like five or six because because of that because like headless is sort of absorbing that functionality slowly. Uh, whereas with instant commerce is is is, is different because they're obviously they're, they're more about sort of providing a better front end for, for Shopify specifically at the moment, which is like kind of a different story. And Shopify has got its own ecosystem that needs to be serviced. So yeah, it's an interesting one. And, you know, as, as far as we're concerned as, as Wordify, front end as a service was like a big, we saw it as like a small talking point and it's sort of slowly become a large talking point. So we're definitely helping clients sort of 
take advantage of that. Some of them wanted to present themselves as as a front as a service. Others wanted to present themselves uh, as a as a you know you don't need a front as a service because we've got such and such functionality already. So yeah. that was interesting to see. But yeah, front as a service is an interesting one. Yeah. Why don't we um, head back to one one thing I want to discuss, which is um, I've got much to say about it, but I just want to mention it. Right. Um, Contentful recently published a blog post called ship your contentful website faster with incremental architecture. Right. So it's kind of like another buzzword now. I don't know if they, if they coined this word, but basically I'll read out their definition. Incremental architecture is an approach to making key architectural decisions during the project, rather than postponing your project kickoff until after you've figured out every last detail. Mm -hmm. It also, it's also about saving time by working in parallel between different systems. So I, yeah, the translation of that is you do it, you sort of build it, you, you make decisions about what goes where as you go, rather than trying to map the entire thing out before you start, basically. I don't know if that's a groundbreaking thing. Um, like kind of, it kind of reminds me of, could be wrong here. It kind of reminds me of like the waterfall project um, yes. management uh, methodology. What do you think? Is that right? Am I totally off? This is not my area of expertise. Am I right about that? Or was it slightly yeah, different? It, it's more building off of the agile, um, agile yeah. um, approach. So previously it would have been waterfall where you had to plan everything. And that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, so I think like most companies nowadays, and this is definitely in software, software development, like agile software development, you try to use those out of software development, do things in sprints, like two week sprints and, have those incremental movements towards things. And I guess that's what incremental archite um, architecture is in that same concept. Yeah. Okay. It's just, um, I think I, in the same article, um, Contentful, oh, it's basically, find a point where they mention it. So what, while you find that, I'll just, I've found like one interesting diagram we've got here. So it's like with a Gatsby site, they're sort of giving you a map of like where, where you could make your decisions. So yeah. evaluating and choosing a CMS and developing the site is like the kickoff and approval phase. And then a discovery phase would be things like evaluating and choosing your framework. So, you know, are you using Next.js for this, are you using Tailwind for this, evaluating uh, your hosting is also in that secondary phase. It's like a secondary phase, adding content, yeah. content to the CMS, developing the site, like an ongoing one. Uh, and then towards the end, it's like, you know, just polishing and building up. So but I, I imagine what I, I think what their argument here is, I mean, I mean, you know, they're saying you can do these things at different, different times, I guess. Um, I'm just not sure how, how this is different to like, again, agile. Like, I'm not sure how groundbreaking this is. I just find it interesting. They've sort of come up with this new term if they have come up with a new term. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. And I did find that point. It's, um, yeah. So it's like one last part. So you can keep going here out in search authentication forms, all kind of other features. So, if you start, whatever you start with, you can keep incrementally adding things. But by that point, yeah. you, have, you have to add all the systems, the workflows together, and that's how you get your architecture. And consequentially, you become an architect. So, and this goes for if you're the tech lead who, who's not supposed to be like the, the architect on the job, but you end up doing it anyway. So I guess that's why they're, they're um, focused on approach. But yeah, I also don't see how it's too much, too different to the yeah. To I guess, yeah, I guess it's kind of typical of, of this space, just a, a slightly different buzzword for something that kind of already exists. Yeah. Uh, but I, I guess I get, I haven't read, I didn't read their entire article all the way through. So I don't want to talk too much about knowing everything about what I've said, but yeah. I guess that the point is with an API first architecture, if you're choosing API first, um, you know, components to that architecture, I guess yeah. the argument there is, you know, it's a lot easier to do this, right? It's a lot easier to do this with, with the API first approach because you can just swap and change things at any time. You don't necessarily, you know, choosing your choosing your CMS this way doesn't necessarily, doesn't dictate what framework you can use, right? Or, or have to use, should I say. So you can yeah. choose that framework. I guess that's the argument here. Because of the flexibility, it, I guess their argument, of course, is when you choose Contentful, you can do this, right? Or when you choose a headless CMS, you can do this, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm just not sure, you know, I'm not sure like how groundbreaking that is, but it is what it is. Yeah. Um, should we move over to like your, your, your last point here? Um, headless um, BI. Yeah. yeah, so this was interesting to me. So just um, let me put it in like the color eye section. Did catch my eye. Mm -hmm. So 
KubeDev announces headless BI of streaming data using KSQLDB and Lambda architecture. So, so I'm not really familiar with KSDB and Lambda architecture, but of course, when they mentioned headless, I was like, okay, headless BI, I've never heard about it. Because yeah. well, we mentioned a lot of stuff like headless CMS, headless content management, headless commerce, and obviously headless is just an architectural approach. So it can theoretically go with anything, but like usually we tend to link it back to content experiences and digital experiences. So it's like, how do they, what is this headless BI? So it seems that basically a lot of these um, business intelligence and analytic tools that um, companies have, they companies use multiple different tools and they have, they create these inconsistencies in how the data gets shared. So you might pull data from one tool and then find out that it doesn't actually match um, how you process your data or, or, or whatnot with, with another tool. So it just yeah. creates all these issues. So the headless BI concept is like an analytical architecture approach where they kind of remove the analytical backend and uh, from the presentation there. So that allows them to move like data metrics from how it needs to be presented and they can create a new way to um, define metrics like a con a, in a consistent way so that no matter what tools you're pulling in, like everything um, can present data in the same way when you want to look at it. So I just think that's an interesting concept, like how headless is like where else I'm just maybe think where else is yeah. headless going to show up and how else are other places going to interpret it? Yeah. I, and and you, you're giving me the idea here, right? And I could, I could, I could um, be making a fool of myself when I say this, but I just had an idea, right? Yeah. So this is headless BI, headless business intelligence, right? Yeah. I wonder if you have at one point headless AI, right? artificial intelligence, right? And what I mean by that is, because I was thinking about what else has like a presentation layer that yeah. could be taken away, right? When I think of AI, again, currently there's like um, copy.ai, which is like, you know, uh, AI that writes content. There's yeah. AI now that, um, you know, you type in a description and it can like paint you a picture of a beautiful landscape, um, yeah. so on and so forth. So this AI kind of, it has a, it, the AI is presenting itself in a certain way, right? So every AI that get, gets built, it's got this niche, right? Whether it's making videos, making like deep fakes, making content, making video, making pictures. Yeah. Headless AI, I imagine once AI gets a little bit more advanced, is like, it's AI, but it doesn't matter what you want to use it for, right? So it's just there and is intelligent enough to, you know, be deployed on your website or to be deployed at your event and to know, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I've been placed in a robot at an event. I should probably be a good host, right? Yeah. And it just, it just walks around being a nice host, even though it was never developed to do that specifically. It's headless, mm -hmm. right? You can put it anywhere and it will do a decent enough job. It's kind of like the jack of all trades of headless of, of, of AI, right? Where it's like, it's not specialized, but it can do a job pretty much anywhere, right? You put it into uh, a 3d printing machine and it learns, okay, I need to pre I need to be printing, you know, AirPod cases or something like that. And you just print the AirPod case in different colors and whatnot. So you, yeah. you know, does that make sense? Or do you, what do you think? I think that is, it makes sense, but like, I think that's literally what we see, like any sort of like sci-fi movie that has AI in it. That's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's presented, but like, we just kind of see, it. I mean, like if you're watching like a movie or a show, you just kind of see it in, um, and yeah, there's AI that can do this. But theoretically, I think if you look at it probably from a development approach, like might need to get like a developer to weigh on this. But I guess theoretically, that's how it would be. It would be headless AI in that sense. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we were very like, although AI is like moving very, very quickly, like copy.ai, yeah. for example, and we, we, we used, uh, what did we use? We used Jarvis, right? We just tried it out to see like if it could help us in any way. Yeah. And as much as the hype was great, it, pff, yeah, it was all right. It was okay. Yeah. What, what, what did you think of Jarvis when we were using it? Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of, because I know a lot of these like AI tools, they kind of market themselves as write a complete blog post, do this, do that. And um, I think what they're good at is compiling um, content. Like if you just want to just ship out content that yeah. just for whatever reason, it could help yeah. you do that. But if you want, if some a person actually reads that content, it's not going to be, it's not going to be great. Co co yeah, it's not coherent. And like in our position, again, as Wordify now, putting our Wordify hats on, 
what yeah. like we tested it out we thought okay could it write an article about headless cms or headless commerce and what it was really doing is pretty much compiling all the content we'd written for so many clients before mashing it all together and it was like well yeah it, it is but it isn't and like it said absolutely yeah. nothing new or real value yeah. and it was at that point i realized like you know i just don't know like ai can only ever spit out what's put into it at some point right simple as that so yeah. will it will it ever and so i look at us and obviously oh wow the content marketing agency is against ai tools like it was shock but i'm trying to be as honest as i can here yeah it's very like when we write for clients we're writing a lot about headless space headless commerce a big part of what we do is you know without being salesy we, 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 we get on calls with our clients and figure out what their vision is and put that into the content and ai simply won't be able to do it like i don't think you just won't yeah. be able to have that unique that uniqueness that is only found outside of the internet if that makes sense right because when we talk to a client about what they think about um front end as a service they give us something that maybe they haven't even said out loud yet let alone written down on the internet or just it's a, it's a new thing it's a trending thing what do you think mm-hmm. we think this here's our here's how our product fits into this landscape great we'll take that we'll build something off of that and we'll, we'll write an article about it it's impossible for the AI to do that because it's only compiling things that have already been published in the past about this topic. So it can never be cutting edge. It's impossible to be cutting edge because it's literally reliant on past data, past content. So it's impossible to be cutting edge. But you know, what do we know? We just, um, we just, you know, content marketers, human content marketers. So I could be wrong about that, but we'll yeah. see. Okay. Um, I think that'll, that'll be it. I think 26 minutes we've had a, Nice episode. What do you think? Where can we improve on this in the future? How do you think it went? Yeah, I think it went pretty good. Um, um, probably just like, let's try to find it as many interesting stories and concepts out there just so we have like a lot to bring up. Because I think another thing about this is like stuff we talk about here that leads to more content ideas. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. Okay. Well, if um, whoever's listening, Thank you for listening, and um, we will be back again next week. Thanks, Andres. Thanks, guys.